wanted to um, do any introductory uh, announcement? I don't think so. I'll let you take it. I'm going to go off camera. <clears throat> All right. Can I get a verbal, my verbal uh, yes on my screen share? Yes. <clears throat> awesome. Welcome, everybody, uh, to today's session, uh, part of our webinar series through Accessible uh, Technology Services. My name is Dan Comden. Uh, I'll be joined uh, later by Gaby DeYoung and uh, Terrell Thompson. Um, what I'm talking about today are alternatives to PDF and uh, a subtitle or alternate title to this might be anything but PDF. So we'll be making the case uh, for the problems that um, are inherent with PDF um, and then also looking at solutions. Uh, I learned a long time ago, you can't just show up with problems. You have to, you have, to have solutions as well. I wanna acknowledge my uh, sons who uh, often make fun of me and some of my approaches to technology, even though I've been working with it for a long time, I will acknowledge that I uh, do have a certain uh, uh, age component to some of the things that I'm saying, but um, I think in this particular instance, what we're talking about is applicable to all age groups. Uh, for those who can't see, it's a, a meme on the screen right now of an old painting, somebody working on a loom and somebody younger working uh, a couple of kids below them, the person at the loom saying, industrial agers are ruining the country, and the child is saying, okay, loomer. So we'll talk a little bit about documents. You know, what is a document? Um, we've got, uh, you know, I think everybody has an idea of what it is, and, you know, just from the Wikipedia page, um, a pretty solid definition of this, but I want to highlight the electronic matter, a piece of written, printed, or electronic matter that provides information or evidence, and it goes on from there. So we're going to talk about, of course, electronic matter and the different kinds of electronic documents, <coughs> pardon me, um, that we work with while we're working in this uh, online world. So we've got Word files, of course, PDFs, um, we've got plain text and almost plain text, which are TXT and RTF formats, uh, PowerPoint files, EPUB is an uh, uh, up and coming uh, format. And then, of course, there's all kinds of other proprietary file formats. Um, we're going to concentrate primarily on HTML and, and why HTML sort of rules this space. And we're going to ignore. Um, audio and video documents um, for, for today. So that I really wanna concentrate on uh, the types of content that we consume online. And primarily that is text. Text is, is still the ruler of the digital information space. Um, we also have images, which can be maps, uh, technical drawings, uh, charts, graphs, and so on. And then we also have STEM content where we're dealing with things like equations and formulas and statistical information. Um, all of this, of course, can be combined into the formats that we talked about. But, um, what I want to talk about today is sort of a hierarchy of the accessible learning tools that are available to us. So we're in higher education, we're talking about learning primarily uh, or sharing information. Um, and so uh, what I want to talk about is this hierarchy with regards to promoting document functionality, which I call HALT PDF for short. And um, that, uh, I guess, could be another alternate title of today's presentation for those of us who work in the accessibility space, PDFs are a, a persistent, ongoing irritation, problem, challenge, what have you, um, to everyone that's involved with either creating them, fixing them, or consuming them. So there's a 
And this is uh, based on my experience and observations over 30 years of working with different uh, file formats, <coughs> talking about things that are inherently accessible. This is um, assuming that these file formats are properly done. Uh, HTML really is the best. Um, structured Microsoft Word files are second. And then below that, we get things like uh, RTF, which has a little bit of structure, but really not much, or plain text, which has no structure. Um, and then uh, below, way below that, we've got things like PowerPoint and PDF. Um, and again, this is based on uh, our observations of electronic documents, um, just not only in the Canvas platform, but just on web platforms um, in general. So PDF is an acronym that stands for uh, portable document format. Um, I've seen and come up with some other ideas for what the, those letters can actually mean. Um, uh, it's a pretty, yet it's a dumb file. Um, probably doesn't flow is another one for the PDF. Um, I think really the most accurate uh, descriptor of what PDF is though, it's a print description format. It really is designed for documents that are gonna make their way to a piece of paper. And a piece of paper is a, a, a very different thing than a screen or a monitor um, or, uh, or even an audio file through, um, or an audio experience through a screen reader. Um, PDFs really are made for print and they're good at that. So don't get me wrong, I don't think PDFs are useless. I think they do have a place, but I don't think they have a place um, uh, online for the most part, for the most part. So we're gonna look at some uh, numbers and these are based on uh, recent and historical interactions with our friends over in the Disability Resources for Students office. They have a uh, quite a large team that are involved with fixing PDF documents, making them accessible for their students with disabilities that they serve. And I wanted to call them out for, um, for working with us um, on, on generating some of this stuff. Um, I will say that over the past year, of course, everything's different for everybody. And it's been different for them in their office as well. So some of the numbers from the uh, last 12 months um, are out of sync with what we've observed over the last 15 years or so. But some of the numbers are the same um, as far as the number of students that they're working with. So they're, um, they're working with just over 1,600 students that are receiving services. Uh, I'll also point out that uh, based on research and survey responses that we've seen here and at other institutions, we know that that count is low by perhaps as much as 50%. So we might be dealing with well over 3,000 students with disabilities on our campus. Um, but we'll, we'll go with what's official now. So 1,600 that are registered and approximately 10% of those over the last year um, are requesting document remediation. And again, that number is down, but also just the number of students in general at the University of Washington, which I just found out uh, is also down uh, over the past year. So again, these uh, recent numbers are, uh, are a bit skewed due to the COVID-19 situation. Um, but if we can go back, I've got some information from prior years and we have no reason to believe <clears throat> that the trend has changed um, apart from the situation of, of students not being on campus. So when I, when I say the prior year, I mean from the summer 2020 to spring 2021, which just wrapped up um, to over 2000 requests for document remediation through DRS and the average number of pages is about 20. So we look at, uh, we break things down into pages. Um, as we'll find out later from Gaby, um, that's um, looking at a, a per page is more important than looking at per file. Um, so we're, 
just over the past year, we're looking at about over 40,000 pages. Uh, and by far, most of those are PDF files. So keep that number uh, in mind as we, as we carry through on this. Um, going back to some numbers provided a couple of years ago, <clears throat> we see that there was a, a pretty much a growth in uh, requests uh, for document remediation. I'm not going to read all of these tables here, but I, I will say they just they just show that um, there was a growth. One of the first things that we look at for um, PDFs and whether or not they're accessible is something called text selectability. So can you, as a sighted person, use your mouse and highlight individual characters within the document? If you click on the page and the whole page becomes selected, then we know that that document is completely inaccessible because it's just a picture of text and not actually text. So um, the numbers uh, skew a little bit for this uh, based on our, our information from six, seven years ago, um, but we still see it's a significant number of things that are entirely inaccessible. And then uh, going for, going past text selectability, we, we want to look to see whether the document has structure. So whether there's tags or um, bookmarks that have been inserted into the document. And we see that those numbers are very, very low. So even for documents that are somewhat text selectable, um, they really, they don't have any structure. They're just a giant gob of text um, over two thirds. And there's no reason um, for us to think that that has changed again. Um, PDFs are expensive. And um, a lot of times the cost of PDFs is really not borne by the uh, individual or department that is producing them. Uh, somebody has to fix those. If a student with a disability, a print disability, needs to be able to use their uh, assistive technology tools to listen to a, uh, the text within a PDF, somebody has to make that uh, fixable. Right now that's um, viewed as an accommodation by the uh, Disability Resources for Students Office. They're the ones that are doing this work. So essentially they're taking products that were made by other uh, individuals and departments on campus and fixing them. Um, and uh, I think we can have, maybe have a whole side dis discussion on whether or not that should be the responsibility of a single entity on our campus. I would argue that the answer to that is probably not. Um, remediation of these files can really vary quite a lot. If, um, if it's a simple uh, document with not very many pages, um, we're looking at about a minute per page to remediate, to fix, right? To make sure that the text is selectable and detectable and also has some structure to it. Uh, the moment we start dealing with more complex things like tables um, or images or math or science, the number quickly, that number uh, quickly climbs. So the number of, uh, minutes per page to remediate uh, can really go up. So looking at our, uh, our 40,000 pages over the last year, if we multiply that out by the other research one schools, of which there are 130 in the United States, we're looking at um, over 5 million PDF pages that um, that are getting fixed every every year nationwide. That's just the uh, the R1 schools. Um, so keep that number in mind when Gaby talks about remediation costs. So over five million, um, the number of public university colleges, two year and four year schools in the United States is uh, about 1600, a little over. And the total number of higher education institutions as recognized by the National Center for Education Statistics is nearly 4,000. So we can even uh, go further out. But of course, uh, enrollment is not uniform across those. 
pardon me. So we've got these costs um, to fix PDFs. And one of the one of the sort of hidden costs is you need to have special software. Um, I like this image of a Adobe Acrobat reader that I found uh, a while ago, uh, which is uh, an image of a gymnast holding a book and reading. Uh, that's your Acrobat reader. That tool will not uh, fix PDFs. If you're going to fix them, you have to have Acrobat Pro software, and that software costs money. The Acrobat Reader software is free, but not the software um, uh, to fix things. So then you're looking at either doing it yourself or you're going to outsource it and outsource it on campus or outsource it off campus. Um, that's that's really the question, but really the cost is time. Um, time, uh, we've got a grumpy cat on the screen. Time is something I don't have for you. We're all pressed for time. I would argue that pushing all of that time off onto a single campus department is uh, perhaps not a reasonable approach to dealing with the PDF problem. Um, PDFs also offer a risk when it comes to the Office for Civil Rights or the Department of Justice um, dealing with complaints about accessibility and the uh, inaccessible documents are a common theme that is woven in many in, into many of the complaints that OCR and DOJ uh, receives. And one of the first things they do when they're evaluating a university is they can go online and they can just look and see what, what is the online presence of that school. And so they're gonna look at everything and that everything does include PDF files. So we don't want that risk. Let's, let's look at it from another direction. Let's not look at everything as a threat or a risk. Let's look at just making the experience better. How do we read our content digitally? We're doing it on screens, right? We're doing it um, in front of a computer. And that computer could be like the computer I have here in my home office, but uh, we're finding increasingly uh, the computers that students uh, are using all the time and prefer to use are their handheld computers or their mobile devices and laptops. And uh, what is on the screen now are a couple of photographs. One is um, an image of the New York Times newspaper on a tiny little screen and yes, many young people who have vision do have good vision and can read that small text. Um, that, uh, that ability doesn't, doesn't usually stay with age, but it also is a challenge to read for just about everybody. Um, a lot of students also use laptops. Not all those laptops have big screens either to, uh, to view this. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the user costs of dealing with PDF files. So when you uh, have to uh, disrupt your browsing session to open a PDF file that contains primarily text, you've just lost all of your navigation. Uh, you've lost your browser experience by having to open up that other piece of software. So that, that navigation goes away. Um, it's it's not impossible for a user to bookmark information in a PDF file, but it's very challenging. And it's not a feature that's built in to, um, to the PDF experience. And that is by design, you know, the, the, that file format is not made to be editable. Um, even editing text with the, the powerful Acrobat Pro software is not an easy experience. And, and there's just, Adobe's just not done it. So the PDF format, which has been around since, I think it, it really started appearing in the early 90s. So nearly, nearly 30 years, uh, Adobe still hasn't provided that functionality. And, and just in general, the company that was initially responsible for the PDF format. Um, I will point out a lot of people think it's proprietary. Uh, it no longer is. It's an open format uh, as of 2008. Um, but 
the primary tools that are used to um, to deal with PDF files still come from Adobe. Um, as an aside, uh, the Microsoft Word, uh, Word for Windows format is only about five years older, but it has quite a bit more capability uh, just inherently as far as accessibility. So again, uh, going back to this slide, the user costs, um, no bookmarks, no, no navigation, um, unless the, the file creator has has inserted the navigation in there in the term of uh, in term of what are pdf bookmarks which are not the same thing as user bookmarks um so getting text out of that may or may not work it uh, it really depends on how that pdf was created it, again if it is an image of text uh, it's very difficult to get text out of it uh, on the user side of things um i in my mind one of the biggest most serious problems with PDF files is that the uh, the text doesn't reflow. So if you're looking at it on a smaller screen, um, you end up having to do a lot of horizontal scrolling, which is very, very difficult to do and retain your place uh, in the document. Um, I think that's, if nothing else, that lack of a reflow really is a, the the stake through the heart of, of the PDF file format, um, that lack of uh, reflow. And also a lot of people don't understand that students with disabilities, I mean, people say, oh, all you need is this extra reading software. Well, students with disabilities often are already using extra software and um, we're, just, we're just layering them up either with, uh, with browser plugins or um, uh, additional applications. Um, they already need that. In the case of uh, students with visual impairments, they're using magnification or they're using screen reading. Um, many students with uh, other print disabilities that do have vision are using TTS or uh, text-to-speech software. So that's a lot to ask um, to, uh, to uh, add on, pile on the cost of the PDF file. So all that said, students often still are asking when they're asked what what file format do you want this fixed file in they're asking for pdf files and um, they don't know about other ways to get information and so they're still asking for pdfs and so it's a it is a question of training for these students and a lot of them will say i know what i like um, i would counter that with they like what they know um, and all of us have a tendency to do this it's not just a disability related thing it's it can be hard uh, or even uh, feel a little painful to make a change um, but we we need to be uh, thinking about what the best experience would be so we've got a rule for aria for those who have been to some of our other webinars aria is a uh, is a a tool in the HTML world for creating accessible internet applications. And the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA uh, when you don't have to. Uh, if there already exists HTML, things work, uh, that will do the job. And I would like to extend that and have that also be the first rule of PDF. Don't use PDF when HTML will work. Um, Jacob Nielsen is uh, a well-known researcher in the um, usability space. Uh, he's uh, in an article going back, I think, to 1996. He talks about his uh, first law of computer documentation, which is users don't read <laughs> computer documentation. And then the corollary to that is if they do read it, um, they're not reading it front to back. They're looking for specific things. And doing that in a PDF file can be very, very difficult. Nobody really reads a manual uh, like you would a book. Um, so we do have examples of places where uh, we can do user documentation. I'm going to point out, let's see here, stand by for just a moment, I want to make sure I've got this. Got it up, there we go. Go back to so what's on the screen now is um, user documentation for Workday. 
Um, and we, uh, we were able to convince early on before Workday was deployed on campus that they initially wanted to do the user documentation in PDF files, and we convinced them that that was not the way to go. And so what we've been able to do is, um, is put this documentation in a place that's easy to find, easy to use, uh, the text flows well, and it works well for everybody. So it's entirely possible um, to do this and to do it um, successfully. And that's in the user guides in the um, integrated service center. So for further reading, for those who are gonna pick up the, uh, uh, this uh, PowerPoint uh, after the presentation, I've got a couple of uh, links here for further reading uh, or further discuss discussion. Um, this first one was, uh, was written just um, last year by the Nielsen Norman group. So I, uh, it's, it's not stale. The one below this where it talks about PDFs being a strange, otherworldly out of browser experience is a bit older, but I think it's still relevant. Um, and then it also uh, another uh, recent document that talks about things more from a like a commercial search engine optimization uh, viewpoint is a, this one titled, Why are PDFs mostly awful and what's the alternative? So how do we publish better documents? Well, part of it, I think, is, is getting some better training out there, which is part of what we're doing today, um, making these uh, making tools to fix the existing PDFs uh, better. Uh, we've got some good ones. Microsoft's you know, ability to export a good PDF is, is well known as part of Microsoft Word. Um, so we need to make sure that people are using this. Do we want to, do we want to institute policies to uh, discourage use of PDF? Um, I don't have answers for that, but I think it's, it's something for all of us uh, to think about. But really, we, we want to talk uh, uh, more with our uh, members of faculty because they're the ones that are putting a lot of the educational materials online. And anybody who is supporting staff in the Canvas environment um, would do well. And Terrell's going to go into some detail on creating good uh, Canvas-based content uh, a little bit later on. So all this said, you, you get the impression I don't care for PDFs, and you would be correct. But I, there is a place for them, um, and I didn't want to sell them completely short. Um, but if there is a, a document that should be printed, it's a great format for that. It really is great for something that's gonna be printed. Um, so things like posters and brochures um, or, or anything that requires an actual physical signature uh, PDF file. So it's gonna get printed out, it's gonna get signed, uh, maybe returned in person or, or by mail. And PDF is an appropriate um, uh, format for that. And of course, there are some uh, official, and I use that word in quotes, uh, or, or legal documents um, that are produced in PDF because there are expectations that these official documents look a certain way. And I'd like, to, I'd like us all to push back on that because uh, so I have been told that some of these forms are official when there's really no official reason for them to be official. It's just what people know and what they've been using. So I want to encourage folks to rethink what a document is and how we consume information uh, now versus maybe 20 years ago. We really, when we're coming up with a report um, or a brochure or any, any kind of information, we want to design it from the start to be viewed on a screen. And we really want to get beyond this paper think idea that, um, that just seems uh, ingrained in so many people and young people as well. It's not an old versus young issue, um, but that's a lot of that is how they're taught is what is this thing going to look like when it gets printed? Well, a lot of this stuff is never going to get printed. It's only going to be consumed on a screen. And so we want to get rid of this idea of a page metaphor uh, for our documents because the size of the page is not relevant if you're viewing it on a handheld devices versus you know, the situation I have here, I've got nearly three feet 
wide of, of screens. You know, those are two very different things. The reading experience is very different. So what is a page? Um, the visual style of our information is not more important than the content in that text. Uh, and it's, I think it's really important for us to keep that in mind. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing now. We're going to hear from Gaby, who's going to talk about how to get uh, information out of our PDFs, as well as a little more information on what it costs to do uh, remediation outside of the DRS office. Go for it, Gaby. All right. Thanks, Dan. Let me take a moment here, share my screen. Okay, everybody can see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So uh, thanks, Dan. My name is uh, Gaby DeYoung. I'm also a member of the IT accessibility team. And uh, when we were prepping for this, we were trying to figure out like different solutions for, you know, what can we use inside of, instead of PDF? And so um, we thought about, well, we can convert PDF to different formats. And so I'm going to talk about converting PDF to Word. Terrell's going to talk about converting PDF to HTML. Um, but one of the biggest misconceptions about PDF is that it can't be edited or changed. Um, but it's actually quite easy to um, take information and edit or change um, a PDF document and just by exporting it um, into a different format. So that kind of blows that theory out of the water. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of information as to uh, the methodology for um, uh, turning a PDF document into Word. And then I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information about the findings um, when, uh, when I uh, accomplished that. Um, so essentially, uh, what I did is I just did a Google search for the term convert PDF word for free and took the top four search results and uh, just uh, uh, had a PDF and just went through these different top uh, search results and just see what that the output is. Um, so I would, uh, I would run them through the, the PDF to word converter and then I'd open them back up again in Word and run the accessibility checker um, to see if there are any errors. And then I also performed a manual review of the styles um, to see uh, what we can compare. So the original document that I used for this conversion process is a completely tagged PDF. The image has alt text. Um, the title is an H1, and the, uh, the other supporting headings there are tagged as H2. Uh, lists are tagged as lists. Uh, the table has a column header, and the document is identified as English, and then we've got one sentence there at the end that is um, identified as uh, French. So the first tool that came up during the Google search is the Adobe Convert uh, PDF to Word. Um, and all of these solutions are all web-based. I didn't want to download anything on my computer. I didn't want to give anybody my um, credit card information for a seven day free trial or anything like that. I just wanted to quickly find a solution for taking a PDF document and converting it to, to Word document. Um, and so, uh, uh, Adobe Convert PDF to Word was the first item that came up and it's completely web-based. And uh, for all of these, it's just a matter of uh, taking your file and dropping it into, uh, into the web browser. Um, but for PDF, um, it did actually require that I created uh, an Adobe account in order to use the service. Um, it's free, it's still free. You just have to sign up with your email um, or something like that so that Adobe can send you annoying um, messages about buying their products. Um, so I did that and then I, um, I opened it up in uh, Microsoft Word and I ran the ex accessibility checker. And uh, in the inspection results, I got a warning and, and this is true for all of the output. 
um, to check the reading order of the tables. So even though the tables were created in PDF with um, a, a column header, um, that did not convert um, back in Word. So um, it did not, the table header did not stick when it was converted back to Word. Um, the H1 was actually marked as a title. Oh, I, and I've actually included a screenshot in here of the styles, um, uh, styles guide, which gives you kind of a, a visual representation of the structure of this document. So you can kind of see there. So the title is marked as, a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, head, uh, the heading level one was actually marked as a title. And then the heading levels two were marked as heading level ones, which can be kind of confusing. Lists were still marked as lists. The document title was still, was still intact. And uh, the French language um, section there was also marked as English. The second method or the second uh, option that came up was uh, simply PDF. And this was completely free. I didn't have to put in my email or anything like that. So I could just drag it into the browser and then it performed its um, conversion process. And then I downloaded it, ran the accessibility check. And again, it gave me the inspection results of a warning that I needed to check the reading order of the tables and make sure that the, um, the column headers were um, marked. Again, same thing for the H1 was marked as a title. Um, H2 was also marked as heading one. So um, kind of a similar output to uh, what uh, Adobe had as well. The second search um, came up with a free PDF convert. And this is another one that's free that does not require any sign up or email or anything. And when I ran the accessibility checker, the inspection results again gave me the warning for the table. And this time, this is really interesting that the H1, instead of being marked as a title, was marked as normal text. Um, but the H2s were still marked as heading one, lists were marked as lists, and the document title was intact, but everything was marked as English language. And then the fourth method was a product called PDF to DocX. Again, this is another free one. And this produced probably the worst results out of all of them. Um, the accessibility checker came up with um, the warning for the tables, but then it also came up with a warning for missing alt text for the image. And the image was not in line with the rest of the text either. And as you can see from this particular screenshot, all of the content um, for this output was marked as normal text. So essentially we have no structure um, for this particular output. So that would be the least desirable um, of all of the outputs. So conclusions for this would be if you wanted to convert your PDF document to a Word document, and there are many reasons to do so, one of them being that uh, PDF is only really uh, uh, supports uh, is really supported on the Windows environment, not so much in the Mac environment. Um, so the, the conclusions would be to use the PDF to Word converter from Adobe Acrobat. But if you didn't want to sign up and get constant annoyances from Adobe, you could use simply PDF, as that does maintain most of the structure. Um, but then, of course, you'll need to, to touch up your tables as those, um, those table um, headers are not uh, converting. I wanted to share a little bit more information about the cost of remediation. I'm actually in the middle of a, a pretty big project right now. Um, we are working on making Canvas model courses that are available to, to UW to kind of review and, and see what a model Canvas course looks like. We're in the process of, of taking uh, these Canvas model courses and making the content accessible. And I wanted to share with you one of the, um, uh, one of the courses so you could kind of get a better idea of all of the, the work um, and the cost that is um, associated with retroactively making a Canvas course um, accessible. So for this particular Canvas course, uh, it has an accessibility score of 57%. 
Um, and you can see that there are 523 elements associated with this course, about 184 uh, PDF documents, about 57 Word documents, um, and some other that items there. And you can see that out of um, out of all of these documents, there's about 189. Is that right? 189 that have a very low score, and I believe most of those are PDF. Um, that would that do require um, remediation. So I uh, I want to break this down a little bit more for you. Um, so for this particular course, there are about 54 documents, which equal to 311 pages. For PowerPoint, there were 87 decks, uh, which included 1,918 slides. For Excel, there were 36 workbooks with 61 uh, worksheets. PDF, there were 182 PDF documents for a total of 2,424 pages. Now, um, we have a contract with a PDF remediation vendor called Open Access Technologies. And uh, I sent this, uh, I sent all these documents to the service for a quote. And we actually have a, a, a standard quote of $8 per page for remediation. But because there are so many documents, um, we got an even bigger discount, a volume discount for $6 per page um, for remediating all of these, uh, all of these documents. Um, and for some of the PDFs, uh, for, uh, they, had, they were quizzes um, and they had some form elements or they should have had some form elements in them in order to, uh, to be utilized uh, accurately. And so there was an additional hourly cost for adding tool tips and form fields uh, to some of these documents. And that was 62 and uh, a quarter, three quarter hours. Uh, at $25 an hour to add that additional information. So the total cost just for remediation of all, the, all of these documents is uh, $29,852. And it took me about eight and a half hours to go through this Canvas course and audit all of the, the, um, audit all of the files to pull them down off of the Canvas course, um, collect them, and then put them in a shared folder so that I can share them with our remediation service. Um, and just a lot of uh, my administrative time just to, just to collect these, um, these documents. Um, and I'm not done yet. I haven't received the completed files from the remediation service. So I still have to replace them in the Canvas course. So there's additional time that needs to be included there. Uh, so, you know, so it does uh, really kind of add up in terms of um, monetary cost and time for retroactively making, um, uh, making a Canvas course accessible and remediating PDF documents. Now, had this instructor from the beginning um, thought about accessibility um, ahead of time and created uh, accessible content while we're putting this course together, it may have taken a little bit longer, um, admittedly, to get this course together, but it would have, you know, probably saved the university a lot of money and saved the university a lot of time had they put the effort up front into making the content accessible. Um, so that's pretty much all I, uh, all I wanted to share with you. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Terrell. Thanks, Phoebe. And just to clarify, that was that was one course of several, right? I've forgotten how many were in the set. Somewhere eight to ten. Yeah, I think there's actually nine courses. courses. Yeah, nine courses, and they then those are you're seeing similar numbers in the other courses too. So this is not just an isolated incident. It's a, a pretty common trend in our online courses. So um, we've got uh, just a little over 10 minutes left, close to 15 minutes left. Um, I just pasted into chat the URL of the archived webinar recordings. So we'll, we'll share our slides there as well. Um, and you also have this recording. Um, but I think I am going to go over. Um, but I got some good stuff. <laughs> so I, I hope that you'll stick 
stick with me because it's going to be fun all the way all the way down to the final slide i think um but if you do have a hard stop at four o'clock then um this is being recorded and so you can catch up um later let me share my screen So as Gabby mentioned, my, my goal is to get to HTML um, because HTML really is the ultimate format. It, from the beginning, has had really good markup for um, structure. Headings have been there since the beginning. Alt text for images have been there since the beginning. So um, yeah, we're talking early 90s. Um, HTML has been accessible. Um, and in HTML 4.0, um, which was many, many years ago, decades ago, they introduced a bunch of new elements that, um, that just uh, sort of set the bar, definitely set the bar for accessibility. So this is where we got um, you know, labels and legends and field sets for forms and where we got table headers and, and the scope attributes and all the things that make tables accessible and much, much more. Um, in HTML and then HTML5 has taken it even a, a step further with new semantic elements that are supported by screen readers. So ultimately, HTML is the best option. It works across operating systems. It reflows nicely. So all the criticisms that Dan had um, in the first portion of this presentation, HTML, um, you know, works. It, it addresses all of those things. And um, and it's cross-platform, which even though we're spending you know so much money and so much time to make PDFs accessible, it really is a Windows-only solution. There is starting to be some support on mobile devices, both iOS and Android, for tagged PDF, but it still is pretty limited um, compared to what you can get with HTML. So, so I wanted to explore how do you get from PDF because we've got you know tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of PDFs out there. And a lot of the PDFs we're using in, in uh, courses in particular are coming from third parties. And so we get a PDF from some somebody, you know, because it's a good resource and we want to use it in our course, man, that's the only format that's available in. So how do you get that and convert it into HTML? Um, you know, is there a way to do that effectively? And so that's what I've been um, doing some research on trying to find a good strategy for doing this. And I approached it from two perspectives. First, what is the best way to convert from PDF to HTML? So similar to what Gabby was doing with Word, but I wanted to get to HTML. And second, what is the best way then to get that converted HTML onto the web? And the three environments that um, most of our web content is delivered in at the UW are the ones that I focused on. Um, Canvas, a Canvas page, a web page using WordPress, or a web page using Drupal. So I started with the same original source document um, that Gaby started with. And I actually used two different versions. Uh, you've probably seen this if you've attended some of our other trainings. We use this document pretty regularly. Um, and in, in its PDF form, um, if it's tagged, then you've got um, you know, the tag structure that Gaby was describing. You've got an image that has alt text. You've got heading one and heading two, you know, two levels of headings. You've got a list. You've got tables that have explicit column headers identified in the PDF tag tree. And you've got a document that's identified as English and one sentence as French. And so I looked at different methods for um, converting that to HTML to see which of these methods preserve the, the tag structure. First of all, I used Acrobat Pro DC. This is desktop 2020. Um, and both Windows and Mac can give you the, the exact same results. Um, and uh, export, the option is export to HTML web page. And you, you get an image in a separate file. So it creates a folder and puts all the assets in there and then links to it. Um, and that's okay. It's, it's harder to distribute that way, but, um, but that, that works. Um, and um, headings are preserved, but one heading in this example is in the wrong place. So it actually put um, textbook above introduction to physics course syllabus that repositioned those. The list was 
coded as an unordered list, which is appropriate. However, um, the bullets didn't work for me. Um, and uh, I tried this in both operating systems and came with the same results. So I don't know why you know, the bullets did not appear, but that, that was a, a visual flaw. Um, column headers, are even though they're tagged as table headers as a TH in the PDF, those are not exported properly. Those are exported as TD. And the document is tagged as English. French content is not tagged. The visual appearance is approximated, other than it, it got those headings in the wrong place. But otherwise, it more or less preserves the visual appearance using inline um, CSS. There's a lot of, lot of additional CSS in the markup um, in order to, to preserve the look. Um, so, OK, but not great. The second method was to upload to Canvas. And uh, when we upload to Canvas, so there's actually a question in chat while you were talking, Gaby, about um, yeah, how you gathered so much data. And I know you did a lot of stuff manually, but there's also is the accessibility report in all Canvas courses. And you know, that's available in the instructor menu. And that is made possible by um, a tool called Blackboard Ally. Um, it's Ally is the name of the product. Blackboard is now the owner of that product, but it works in multiple learning management systems, including Canvas. And it does a few things. It checks the accessibility of materials that are uploaded into the course and provides instructors with feedback. Um, but it also allows users to generate um, custom versions or alternative versions of everything that gets uploaded. And so uh, if you upload a PDF, then uh, users, students, can download um, an HTML version or versions in various other formats. And um, when you do that, uh, the image is recreated as part of the HTML document. And so it's not a separate file, which makes it a lot easier to distribute. It's, it's using the base 64 uh, image source attribute. And so it encodes the image and that um, then is, is in the source code. So it's part of um, the, the HTML document itself, not a separate file. Um, headings are preserved. So it got the, got the heading ones right, heading twos were all right. The list is coded as a, an unordered list. Um, it, uh, it doesn't try to stylize the bullet so you don't end up with those funky broken font. Um, icons. It, it just lets the browser render the list as it will by default. Um, column headers are correctly tagged as THs. Um, and I think they even uh, had uh, scope equals call. So it got the, the scope attribute on there. Uh, documents tagged as English. The French content is not tagged. And so that, that actually was a problem. I, I found no solution. It sounds like AB found no solution too for the language issue. That's not communicated well across platforms. So it's kind of an isolated issue. If you have a multilingual document, then that would need to be addressed after you convert. Um, but uh, most documents probably are not going to face that unless you're in a uh, foreign language um, discipline. Um, and uh, again, the, the HTML output, actually differently from what Acrobat created, um, it includes it does include a CSS block that provide some styling, but it doesn't rely so extensively on CSS. Um, and the thinking with HTML is, particularly if you're gonna plug it into another platform, if you're gonna plug it into your Canvas course, or if you're gonna plug it into WordPress or to Drupal, you've already got a theme where, um, you know, for, for that, uh, that context, for that website. And uh, ideally, it won't have a bunch of inline styles. It will just accept the theme and the document will plug in. It won't look like it originally looked, but it'll look like all the other pages within that website or within that course. And so that really is ideal, I think, to not have that kind of uh, extra styling. Um, but but it does, um, you know, Ally does add a little bit of CSS so that you um, have some of the same um, styling that you had in the original. Um, I also looked at our, another tool that we provide. Um, this is available. There's a URL in the top corner, tinyurl.com slash uw-doc-convert. Um, that's for our UW document conversion um, service. 
Um, this is powered by Census Access. And it's a third party tool that we license. And the nice thing about this, the reason that we have it in place is because it takes DRS, Disability Resources for Students, some time to generate alternative formats on behalf of students. And so this is a service that, that um, students can use or anybody with a UW Net ID can use to upload a document, get it back in a wide variety of formats um, through email and, um, and, and you know, just converting it to an alternative format so that you can access it more easily. And we do have a number of students who use this on a regular basis, um, but for HTML, it doesn't produce nearly the level of output that Ally does within Canvas. So uh, the, the output is readable. It actually will do OCR, so if you've got a scanned PDF, it's just a picture of text, no, no actual text. It will convert that to text, so the document then is scanned and converted. It may have some errors, depending on how bad the original is, but, but there is text there. Um, however, there's no semantic structure. Um, it doesn't even make any effort to read the PDF tag tree that's under the hood. It just tags everything. Everything is essentially a paragraph. Uh, the table is tagged as a table, but um, the headers are TDs, not THs. Um, and um, it, you know, everything's a paragraph, all the headings and everything. It does bold headings if they originally were bold, bold but um, doesn't uh, add any structure to them. So not, uh, not a great tool for converting to HTML. Um, method 4A, there are lots and lots of PDF to HTML conversion tools. So if you do something similar to what Gaby did and just do a Google, a Google search for PDF to HTML conversion tools, you'll get dozens, maybe even hundreds of results. Um, and I, I didn't want to try them all. I wasn't quite brave enough to do that because I was afraid of you know, what, what sort of uh, malicious things I might be downloading to my computer. But I looked for kind of top 10 conversion tool lists from credible sources and compared them and found a few tools that were referenced um, in multiple places and felt that those were worth the risk to, to try. And what I found, I'm not naming any names here, because I found that, that essentially they're all the same. They produce PDFs that are exact, if not almost exact, if not exact replicas visually of the original, really focused on preserving visual appearance, but they don't have any semantics. Um, I should, I've got a screenshot here of some source code from one of these documents. And the whole thing is divs nested within divs, nested within divs, very deep div levels of divs. Everything in the entire HTML document is a div that has an enormous amount of um, classes and inline styles added to it um, in order to make it look the way um, it looks. So, um, my conclusion from that is the only way to get from PDF to HTML with tag structure in place is if you're using a tool that is specifically designed for that. So one that is focused on accessibility, like Ally, um, will get you where you need to get and, and exporting from Acrobat um, gets you there as well, but not one of these other tools that, that is not designed for accessibility. So that's if you start with a tag file. So recognizing that most of the PDFs out there are not tagged, they were not designed with accessibility in mind, how do we get to tag PDF uh, or tag HTML? Um, so we have the same document available in an untagged format. So it is just text. There's, um, the image has no alt text. Um, those headings are not really headings, they're just big bold text. There's um, uh, no, no underlying tag structure at all, so accessibility is not possible in the PDF itself. So, so now we're relying on the conversion tools to assign tags intelligently. And with Acrobat Pro, if we export to HTML, then it does create an HTML with tag structure and actually did a surprisingly good job. This is an area where this has improved over the years. Um, 
The image, it doesn't make any effort to intelligently assign alt text to that. It, um, as you probably have seen, the science there is getting better, where um, Microsoft Word, for instance, if you upload a document into a Word doc, it will add an alt text uh, using artificial intelligence. Um, not always great, and usually it needs to be edited, but at least they're attempting to do something. Um, in this case, it just says uh, alt equals image. Every image gets that alt text. Um, the H1 and H2 in this sample document were correctly tagged. And so um, that your mileage may vary depending on the complexity of your document and whether, uh, I don't know what the alg algorithm is, but presumably they're looking at text size and, um, you know, and position relative to other text and things like that. And in this case, it was able to intelligently um, identify the, the headings properly. The list was correctly tagged as a as a an unordered list. The column headers it missed that one. It uh, assigned them as TDs, not THs. And again, no language at attributes. And again, similar to the original export from Acrobat, we had a visual appearance that was approximated using inline CSS. Um, again, identical results in both Mac and, and Windows. Um, Ally, this is where. Uh, Blackboard Ally really shines, I think, that if you feed it an inaccessible PDF, it is able to, to intelligently convert that. Um, it did not do anything with the image, and I need to play, play with this some more. I'm not quite sure why that is, but it, in the original, when it was tagged, it was able to take that image and encode it into the HTML document. Um, in this case, there was no image in, in the untagged document. So apparently it's using the tag tree in order to understand something about the image, um, which kind of kind of surprised me. But uh, I don't know, you know, all the inner workings of the underlying structure of a PDF. And so apparently that, that's a challenge, getting an image out of an untagged PDF. Um, the, uh, the tags um, that are the headings, H1, H2, correctly tagged. The again that textbook for some reason that heading is in the wrong place so that happens in multiple um, tools. The list is correctly tagged. Column headers are correctly tagged. Um, language again it misses that. Um, and again they're like the original ally output. There was uh, some CSS, but not as much CSS if you go from um, from Acrobat. But um, particularly, you know, what kind of sets this apart is the column headers in the table. That was really a, a, you know, a difference um, that Ally is able to do that and not a, and Acrobat was not. And if the, the original document is tagged, Ally embeds the image um, in the HTML file, which also separates it, you know, kind of sets it apart in terms of the conversion tools. Uh, since it's access, you know, it wasn't able to do much with the tag PDF, um, and so I didn't expect it to do anything better with an untagged PDF, and the results actually are, are identical. So its method works consistently, no matter what you feed it, um, and it's not, it's not great. It's not, there's no structure. So given all that, that's, that answers my first, the first part of my question. How do you get from PDF to HTML? Um, the best way is in um, from what from what we've just walked through is to use ally ideally you start with a tag pdf but if that's not available ally still does a pretty good job of uh, intelligently adding structure to the html document um, so that process then upload the pdf to a canvas course go to the alternate formats menu and download the html version um, if you don't have access to Canvas, then using Acrobat Pro DC is another option. Export to HTML from, from there. Um, again, a couple things, at least in the, the testing that I did where Ally does a better job, but both of these could be viable. So then the second part of my question here, my research is what is the best way then to take that converted HTML and plug it into your online course? Um, and I, I used, for these tests, I used the um, Ally output um, since I was sold on, on what it was able to do. So a good tagged HTML, it's got all the right, um, the right stuff, or most of the right stuff. 
Um, one, one method, so we focus on Canvas, first of all. If we copy the, the HTML document, open up the Ally converted document in your browser, copy it, then paste it into the Canvas rich content editor, um, where you, you go in and you create a new Canvas page, just paste that content directly into the rich content editor, not in the HTML editor, but in the visual rich content editor. Then what you end up with is all the HTML elements and attributes are preserved. The H1 element is preserved, um, even though H1 in our Canvas environment is not available as an option. Um, H1 is the title of the page, which you assign in another field. So, um, so ideally, there shouldn't be an H1. The first level of headings would be H2. But if H1 is important, um, you know, in the original, you want to preserve that then it does convert exactly as you copied it and you paste it, it will save that H1. Um, the base 64 image, um, if you're using the ally version that includes that embedded image, that base 64 image is stripped out. When you paste it into the rich text editor, it actually is there, you can see it. And you can add, you, know, you can check the alt text, make sure that's good, do all the things with image formatting that you, you can do with any image. But when you save it and publish it, that image is stripped out then. So I actually have raised a ticket. I, I uh, sent a ticket to help at UW and have been talking with the Canvas people. Um, our uh, service owner um, at, uh, in, with Canvas is out of the office until after Independence Day. But um, this has been escalated to Canvas to Instructure to see if it's even technically possible for them on their end to preserve that base 64 image. Um, and so uh, I'll keep, keep y'all posted um, as to um, you know, whether, whether it's possible to keep that. Um, but anyway, that is stripped out. And so you would have to add images back um, if you use this method. Uh, the tables have no border, um, but those can easily be added. And so you paste the content in and then you do some touch up. Um, and you're probably gonna have to do a little bit of touch up regardless of which method you use. Um, one really interesting caveat that took me a while to, to test this thoroughly and really track it down is that if you copy from any browser other than Firefox, and you know, there's, there are a couple bullets here of everything I tried, um, copy from Chrome or Safari and Mac OS, copy from Chrome or Edge and Windows 10, and then paste that into Firefox in either Mac or Windows in the rich text editor in, in Canvas, then what you get is all the inline styles are added and preserved. And so I showed the source code here that it everything that was in that, uh, that ally doc where it did have some inline styles, uh, everything gets preserved. And if you start with the Acrobat, um, exported HTML file that has a lot of inline styles. Again, it's the same thing. That content gets preserved, but only in Firefox and only if you copy from a browser other than Firefox. So if you copy from Firefox and paste into the rich text editor in Firefox, this doesn't happen. It only, um, for whatever reason, Firefox seems to be taking that inline style content and preserving it from other browsers, but not from itself. Um, and I, I honestly don't have a good explanation for why that's happening or whether it's a feature or a bug, um, but it, it is happening. I tested it extensively and it, it reliably happens. So if anybody knows why, you know, I would love to, to talk further about that. And hopefully it's not a bug that they're gonna fix and this goes away because it might be useful. However, um, as, as Dan has pointed out, and I'm, I'm convinced too, that the appearance really should not be a driving force um, here, that ideally when you paste content into your Canvas course, it will look like all your other Canvas pages, not like a, a separate document. And it's the content that really reigns supreme. So um, adding to WordPress, um, if you copy from a browser, open it up in a browser, copy it, paste it into WordPress. And I did this uh, with, with our accessible technology website. We are using the hosted um, uh, WordPress service from UMAC. And 
Um, it, you know, this is the boundless theme. It adopts the styles of the theme. And so uh, the inline styles may actually be there, but they're overridden in most cases by the, the styles from the theme. Um, and, and the base 64 image is stripped out. Um, I have not talked to you, Mac, to see whether that, uh, that could be preserved there. Um, so, but it looks like the theme. It's branded properly for the website, and that really is ideal. That, that it should look like other pages on the site. So it's not, I don't think it's important that it preserve the styles. If you add to Drupal, um, copy and paste, um, ally converted HTML, paste that into the Drupal editor. And this is the default Drupal editor. So I just used a clean copy of Drupal 8 uh, with nothing, nothing other than out of the box Drupal um, and uh, pasted and this was the one place where the base 64 encoded image is in fact preserved. Um, and it has alt text because you know, the alt text um, it was there in the original. All, in all of these cases, the structure that's there is preserved. Um, inline styles are added uh, a little bit. And, and again, the rule of Firefox um, and other browsers, that relationship um, is true regardless of what you're pasting into. Um, and the, the catch here, though, is that the text format, uh, when you paste into Drupal, there is a text format field. And the options there are full HTML, basic HTML, and restricted HTML. And with restricted HTML, you have particular tags that are allowed while others are not. Um, probably the chances that you have full HTML enabled are pretty slim. I imagine most, um, you know, behind the scenes uh, uh, Drupal um, uh, webmasters are tightening that up a little bit, but you do have to have full HTML in place for um, to preserve the appearance and to get that base 64 image. And so, so my initial excitement may may have worn off now that you know that. Uh, but if you do have access to a Drupal site where full HTML is allowed, or maybe that is conditional based on privileges and certain users have full HTML privileges, um, then you know, talk to your webmaster about that because maybe that could be opened up enough so that people can paste um, you know, HTML documents, including the images from those HTML documents. So given all that, the, the ultimate recommended workflow um, is to, um, uh, again, ally. So the first two bullets are the same as what I showed earlier. Ally is your best bet. Um, Acrobat Pro exporting from that is the second um, best option. Then open the converted HTML page in a web browser, copy it, paste it into the rich text editor of your uh, whatever, your content management system, your learning management system. And if preserving the original appearance is important, then you need to do that. Uh, other browser, non-Firefox to Firefox trick. And then finally, no matter what you do, there's probably going to be some touch-up required. And so you know, check it, make sure the headings are appropriate. Um, if not, you know, fix the headings. That's probably the most important thing is just make sure you've got a good heading structure that forms an outline. Um, make sure that lists are coded as lists. And if not, you know, select them and click the list button in, in the Rich Text Editor toolbar to make them into lists. Make sure your tables have, have headers. Make sure your images have alt text. And probably, in most cases, unless you can get that base 64 image to be preserved, then probably you're going to need to re-upload images into the HTML page. So, so there may be a little bit of work on the, the final as a final step to sort of touch things up and make sure that it's a you know, good working functional document with all the information you want. Um, but that arguably is going to be a lot less work than all the work that goes into fixing an inaccessible PDF, as you've seen from uh, my, my co-presenters here. So um, it looks like we didn't lose too many people. We still have um, a crowd of 13. And uh, probably, it looks like some content in chat. Have others been monitoring that to see are those actual questions? Or yeah, are there any questions? Yeah, there were a couple questions. I, th I, th 
<laughs> we eventually got to them. I, of course, had you had it backwards at one point, but you know your slides <laughs> corrected me, and I made sure to point point out that the pasting has to be into Firefox, which is right. just surreal. It's like, <laughs> it, is this 1990 again? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. I wish I knew more, and I actually still plan to to continue this investigation and see, you know, what I can learn. But um, I, I've never heard of this before, so I don't know. I don't know if other people are even aware of it. If if anybody at Firefox, if anybody at Mozilla is aware that their tool has this magic functionality. <laughs> All right, we've got a little bit of time. Well, we're way over time, but. I, you know, I think the stuff that that Gabe, Gabe and uh, and Terrell had to share was just fantastic, um, and I uh, I appreciate the collaboration once again. Uh, any questions you can you can ask them here if you want to hang out for a little bit more, or you can contact us directly. Uh, there is a question there, Terrell. So in, in terms of students enrolled in a course that has PDFs posted in Canvas, using the Ally tool could make those docs accessible. Um, it, um, it, the potential is there. Um, it certainly does its best um, and, and arguably does a better job than uh, other automated tools, better than census access. But um, it also is garbage in, garbage out. And, and this is all based on one document, which is a pretty simple document. And visually, it's really easy to tell what the structure is. So whatever allies algorithms are, are not tested extensively with this document. But imagine if we throw a bunch of um, you know, much more complex, ugly documents at it, it's going to be sort of hit and miss. It'll be able to, to you know, create accessible HTML out of those some of the time, but it's going to be problematic other times. And that's not a substitute. Relying on that is not, not a substitute for creating accessible documents um, from the get-go. Yeah, You're better off. I mean, really, we need, to, we need to go back to our content creators and say, look, why you really press them on this whole, why, why is it a PDF? Because if they think they're doing it because it's, more secure or less changeable they're, they're, they haven't let's say an incomplete understanding of what PDF is it's not it's not secure it can be changed um, and really in the interest of making things more readable easier to use more accessible if they're starting with a word document uh, pasting into canvas from that word document is really a, a great way to go uh, it's native to the uh, to the platform, it's going to flow well on all kinds of different devices, and it really is a superior way to present information. Um, a comment about STEM fields use, using tech and law tech, yeah, that's that's kind of a, a whole nother world. I will say that presenting math in PDF files is a is still a, a I don't want to say terrible. Can I say terrible? It's not a good experience. Um, it's really not a good platform for sharing uh, for for sharing STEM content. Uh, tech and law tech is much better for writing and reading it, assuming people have the viewers for that. Uh, Canvas does have some good integration for law tech, um, and then we get involved with with producing uh, Braille uh, from law tech as well. So that actually renders uh, quite well when we when we take that next step of producing. Uh, bumpy paper or braille documents, actual physical braille documents, but that's really outside the course, uh, uh, the the scope of this of this talk. I will say that LaTeX is actually pretty good. It's another markup. It actually predates uh, HTML. Also, Canvas now uh, it renders. If you you can use LaTeX to author. Um, math equations, and it, it then renders those in MathML, which is, is becoming uh, pretty well supported by assistive technologies. Um, so I, I haven't looked at converting math content. That was actually something I saw an early prototype of Ally before it got purchased by Blackboard. Um, 
where they were doing math conversions. So there, I know there is some of that going on behind the scenes, but I, I haven't really explored that fully to see how, um, um, you know, how successful that is overall. But, um, but I think you know, some combination of all these things, um, you know, could, could result in uh, you know, accessible math within courses uh, without a whole lot of extra effort. I know if you just if you just type formulas directly into the rich text editor using the math uh, the math tool um, within the Canvas rich text editor, then you get accessible math. So so that's that's a one nice way to go. Um, there is a question about. Uh... PowerPoint or Google Slides in a more accessible format that is also non-editable. Um, I, I personally encourage people to, to set aside the idea of, of non-editable. You can make it difficult to edit, um, but you know the the, the Canvas uh, instructor essentially is the one who gets to say what what the source is. Um, but I you know I. I haven't done a lot of instruction. I don't know what all the ins and outs of that are. Maybe that's a whole another uh, presentation. Um, I mean, if you want to make things non-editable, -edit typically what you end up with is also inaccessible. Can I One thing in? about? Yeah, go uh, ahead, Joe. I, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to clarify that this is not a course. It's uh, more like what you're doing now. You're going to send out these slides to everybody, but what format are you going to send them out in? Is, is that format accessible? We're doing something very similar with our webinars. We do the webinar and then we send the slides out. So, uh, and they're not to students since it's not on Canvas. Do you have any suggestions in that uh, circumstance? We're not going to send these out. All three of our decks are in PowerPoint and they um, will run the PowerPoint accessibility checker. Um, and that will give us, you know, um, some some tips if we overlooked, you know, adding alt text to some of these images and and you know some other things that uh, we need to look at. Um, we're not we're not concerned about um, the uh, uh, you know the the content being non-editable or other people being able to use it. And so that that part of the question we can't relate to necessarily. But just in terms of accessibility, PowerPoint is a good format natively. Um, Google Slides, if you do ultimately decide you want to go to PDF um, with an interest in non-editable, again, you, know, you can convert from PDF, as Gaby demonstrated, um, you know, to other formats. And so it's not really, you could still get to that content. But uh, if you export from PowerPoint to PDF, then it creates a decently accessible tag PDF. All the alt text will be preserved. You'll have a heading above each. On you know, each slide is represented by a heading, so it's really easy for screen reader users to navigate. If you export from Google Slides, Google does not generate a tag PDF at all. So for for docs or slides, um, so that definitely if you're going to export, um, stay away from the the G Suite. Uh, Amy's got her hand up or had her hand up. You still with us? We are yes. well over. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm here. I'll, I'll try to keep it quick, but I work with Joe and so uh, our questions are related. But um, I, Dan, on your hierarchy that you had of the like most desirable to undesirable electronic uh, document formats, I think that PowerPoint was kind of down at the bottom close to the uh, PDF. And um, so that kind of raised bells in my head and made me wonder if there was something, you know, we should be trying to export our PowerPoint files to yet like a different kind of. Yeah. No, that's, that's or... an excellent point, Amy. Thanks for catching that. Um, PowerPoint can't, like Terrell just said, it can be pretty accessible. Uh, it's not a very accessible platform to work within for mm -hmm. anybody who needs to create content, um, but the content can be made very uh, accessible. Um, again, you know what what is the value in that PowerPoint, mm -hmm. and and would it be better served as being a, a just a, an HTML file or a set of HTML files? Um, 
So the problem is that so much PowerPoint is created that is terrible for accessibility mm -hmm. because um, the, the analogy, I, you know, you, you can do all kinds of inaccessible things very, very easily using that tool, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, also, the, and Amy, you and I have talked about this recently, but yeah. um, we, we have done some recent research. Um, it looks like Hadi left. Hadi left early? What's up with that? <laughs> 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 he, he kept us around for two solid yeah, days. Yeah, that's hardly fair. The last two days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Hadi and Gaby and I sat down and, and looked at, um, did some extensive PowerPoint testing, uh, just what, you know, observing how he interacts with PowerPoint. And, and essentially, you know, he would go into slide view mode and would view it as a slideshow using a screen reader. And the results with JAWS versus NVDA right. are completely opposite one mm -hmm. another. And so that and we're we're working on gathering notes from that that mm -hmm. session and you know, documenting what we found and, and probably filing some bugs with screen reader um, developers to try and get mm -hmm. some consistency there. But that for that reason, I'm hesitant to, to say PowerPoint should be high on Dan's hierarchy yeah. list. And for, through no fault of Microsoft's, I think it's just the system technology support. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the other thing that we're realizing too is just that, like, we're we're these are like info sessions and group advising slides, and we're trying to stay consistent with the UW branding, and that is also something that gets very difficult to maintain because you have to download and install special fonts and to look at, to see them in their proper format. And so students and prospective students aren't necessarily gonna have those fonts downloaded. So then it all looks funky and- um, they, do, they do publish those alter, standard alternative fonts though on their- That's true. Boundless page, that's what, that's what mm -hmm. I use. Okay. Joe has his hand up. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, we're still talking about PowerPoint, Amy, and, and I, but um, this is actually goes to a bigger point. Uh, one of your arguments against PDF was that you have to have one more layer of proprietary software to read a PDF file. The same is true of PowerPoint and Word. Okay. And, um, you know, if you're a UW student, yeah, you can get that for free, but we're dealing with a lot of prospective students and people outside the university. So, um, is there a way to avoid using these other proprietary formats like Word and PowerPoint? I've HTML. been trying to I've been trying to but I've been trying to find a way to convert a PowerPoint to an HTML. Again, this is a webinar, so we are doing a PowerPoint presentation. And I can't find a, a decent way to convert a PowerPoint to HTML. They used to have it, but they've taken it out. Do you have any other suggestions or ways to do that? There are that actually would be another a great topic for another session, I think. Um, but there are quite a few tools, free tools for um, doing HTML slides. So it's an alternative to PowerPoint. It's not exporting from PowerPoint, but um, uh, Slidey, I think was one, um, slider.js. There are um, a lot of tools that use, the idea is you use standard HTML and then you add a JavaScript file to that that renders that standard HTML as an as a, a interactive um, slideshow. And then you style everything using CSS. Um, I used to actually, for uh, a period of my life, I used that exclusively for um, slides because um, I mean, nothing beats the standard HTML with a little bit of CSS and JavaScript and you know, it works in your browser. But the challenge there was distributing it that, um, uh, people just expect PowerPoint um, is so kind of universal, I guess, and they, they want to copy my slides. And, and if I'm using, you know, one of those HTML tools, I have a bunch of files involved. So I could just send them the HTML file, which has all the content, but it's not going to be rendered then as slides. And it's not going to have the visuals from the CSS. And um, so it, it just was less desirable from a you know, sharing content perspective. But just if it's going to be online, you know, that might be a viable solution. I did for a while look at exporting from uh, PowerPoint to 
Um, and I, I know that what I haven't looked at it recently, but what they used to do in terms of when you export to HTML, it wasn't, it wasn't good. It was nowhere near the quality of HTML that you get if you're just creating it from HTML from scratch and using a tool like slider.js to, to render it. PowerPoint to PDF to HTML, where, do, where does the madness end? <laughs> Yeah, can't we all just have one format? <laughs> <laughs> the world will probably be less interesting. H, you, know, you know, it, it, all that said, I love ebooks, right? I'm on ebooks all the time. That's my preferred method for reading books anymore. I still love actual print books, but when I'm reading nowadays, it's all so EPUB, uh, Kindle format, all that stuff works works really well. I still getting a book in PDF is a real soul crusher though because that is no fun uh we are well over our, <laughs> our hour scheduled time um thank you everybody for uh sticking with us uh it's always a fun conversation um stay cool in the, the forthcoming heats hot 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 coming stay cool thanks everybody <laughs>